Well, good evening. Welcome. How many of you is this the first time in City Hall? <laughs> well, welcome. I have, I'm Kirsten Holsheimer Gale. I have the great honor to serve as the mayor of the City of Euclid. Uh, we're still having a few people come in, but what a great turnout. Um, unfortunately, it's because of problems we're experience, you're experiencing along the lake. Um, I have had the great fortune to grow up on the lake, and just because they're here, I'm going to introduce my parents, Rich and Linda Holsheimer. <laughs> Um, and so we, over the last, um, I, I actually several months, if not longer, we've been getting a lot of calls from residents who are experiencing erosion, asking for assistance and guidance from the city. Um, obviously, and as you've been watching as you sit down, we have you know, our project underway, but you as private property owners, and some of you are here representing your beach clubs or are on streets adjacent to the lake, we know that the erosion that's happening and the water level that's high is of critical importance to you. We don't have all the answers to help private property owners, but we have worked with great uh, technical experts and have great partnerships with the state. We wanted to use our relationships, our project, and what we've learned through that to help educate you, help provide you with resources, uh, information, education for what we can do along our shoreline. So today we have a great group of people here to speak to you. Um, Deborah Beck, who is from the Office of Coastal Management from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and Steve Holland, also from ODNR Coastal Management. Bill Rosnick, who is a civil engineer with Smith Group, who is our um, consultants that we've worked with for 10 years on our lakefront project. Mark Haynes and Craig Smith from Hain Mark Haynes Construction, who are building our lakefront project. Um, and so we wanted to bring together these resources for you. Uh, we're hoping tonight you will get information um, and some ideas, at least learn a little bit more. But the other piece that's important is we were hearing from several residents. And so the important thing, some of you have been here for a long time, probably have undertaken erosion control measures already. Um, some maybe your neighbors has. The important thing we want, hopefully, um, come together as neighbors because we know and you who live on the lake know if you do something but your neighbor doesn't there's going to be a negative consequence so we need to think about this in a bigger picture uh, we're here to help and support unfortunately we don't have funding so I'll say that right off the fr off the top we don't have funding for private property um, but we're going to learn some from some folks about what can be done and different opportunities different options um, I do want to introduce, we have a number of council members here who have worked hard and really committed to helping residents and helping to understand and push forward our lakefront project, starting with Council President Charlene Mancuso, who's in the back. I saw Christine McIntosh from Ward 4, 5, I'm sorry, Ward 5. Uh, Chris Jaros from Ward 4. Um, John Wotilla from Ward 6, Daryl Langman from Ward 7, all have been part of w working with us to improve and enhance our lakefront. So we cannot, I don't want to, and I also want to acknowledge and thank our staff, Allison Lucasy Love, who is our uh, lake, working really very closely with our lakefront project, has shepherded through very well. We appreciate all her hard work. Jonathan Holliday, the Director of Planning and Development, uh, who's been working on this for a long time as well. It is a true team effort. And so I want to thank them and thank our guests for being here. Um, as you know, you're experiencing it every day. We are seeing erosion, um, as the Plain Dealer called it in 2018, at a catastrophic level. Those of you who live along the lake are living with that. Uh, the rates of recession of the shoreline going back decades um, are, have really been accelerating and are increasing because of storms and because of the water level. You're going to hear more from the experts on this. I'm going to just go through some of this real very quickly. Euclid has been in the national spotlight primarily because of how we are approaching our erosion control for the city pr project. Um, so people are watching not only all over Northeast Ohio, but the country of our lakefront improvement project and what that can do to address erosion. So I want to talk just very quickly so that you have some context um, about our waterfront improvement plan. Um, as you know, Euclid, 
and who live along the lake, only 6% of our shoreline is accessible to the public. So being a lakefront community, you know how important the lakefront is. We wanted to take advantage of that. We wanted to make sure Euclid is not only a lakefront community in name, but that our whole community has access to the lakefront. Um, so we've been working on a plan 10 years ago, actually, we hired Smith Group, uh, Smith JJR at the time, to develop a community plan. We'd included a number of community uh, input sessions, vis visioning sessions, um, really came up with a plan to, for our lakefront, that includes erosion control, but also incorporating public access to the lake so that the whole community, we really can be proud to be a lakefront community. Um, phase one was completed in 2013. That's the Joseph Farrell Memorial Pier, uh, which I'm hoping everyone has been down to, but if you haven't, this is what it looks like. Um, our second phase is what is under construction now and is a way that we've addressed primarily the erosion control and the shoreline improvements that have to happen. Um, we are working, it is a three quarter mile uh, multi-purpose trail, erosion control, it restores some of the native habitat um, and it took a long time to get there. So we've, as I've said, we engaged Smith Group 10 years ago. This particular project, we've had years of engineering. We had probably a year and a half or two years to work with private property owners to um, acquire the easements because as if those of you and some of you are here know, uh, many of the homes in this project area are private or streets who have the beach club associations at the lakeside, so we had to get all of those people on board and sign on to this project. It is a win-win, it is a private-public partnership. The private property owners have, will receive erosion control, the public receives access to the lakefront. So we're really uh, proud of this project. If you haven't had a chance to see it, we invite you to come down. We have a public tour uh, tomorrow night and we have two more throughout the summer. Um, take a look at what it, really what it's going to be. And you saw on the video as you walked in, hopefully, um, some pictures of that. We are getting national press and recognition because of this project, because of that, how we've been able to get private property owners on board, because of how we are mitigating erosion, but creating public park space in the process. So that's an exciting process. We've won awards both for the planning, uh, hopefully for the construction, um, and just wanted to give you kind of some snapshots because the folks that you're going to hear from have helped make this project happen. And this project, while it's three quarter mile, and you are looking at most likely much smaller projects, there's definitely some things we can learn from this project and the work that from all three of the speakers that you'll hear from. Um, the top is the renders, the bottom is actually what's being done at the moment. Uh, we've had a couple of stakeholder tours where we've invited people out to see the process. Uh, this is from the pier. There will we'll be also incorporating other, other aspects of the project like stormwater improvements and uh, water runoff, but there'll be a welcome plaza um, at the western end. But we're really envisioning this as a way not only to uh, mitigate the erosion, but also really to add a great amenity, public space, and a new vibrancy to our city. So we would, again, just a larger photo. Uh, would like to invite you tomorrow at 5.30, there will be a tour of the project area. Additionally, uh, those will happen July 18th and August 8th. So if you have a chance and you want to get down uh, and see the project, see how it's taking shape, we would invite you to do that. Um, I am not an expert on this, so we have invited our experts to join us so that you can hear directly from them. Um, and so at this point, it's my uh, honor to introduce Deborah Beck. Uh, Assistant Chief of Office of Coastal Management of ODNR uh, to come up and share. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, thanks everyone for coming. I'm excited to be here. I, I wish it was on uh, maybe lower water levels and all the great beaches that are building because the water levels are so low, but unfortunately it's high water levels and all the erosion that's occurring because there's such high water levels. So I am, get to 
Let's see if I can figure this out. My name is Debbie Beck. I'm the ODNR Office of Coastal Management Assistant Chief. My background, I am a registered professional engineer with the state of Ohio, and I specialize in coastal engineering, geotechnical engineering, and also I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in geology. So hopefully I know a little bit about what I'm about to talk about. So uh, main topics for today include water levels, shoreline types, causes and effects of erosion, erosion control solutions, temporary shore structure permits, and then available assistance from ODNR. So the big thing to remember is that water levels do change over time. Water level data is available from the time period of 1918 through 2019 on the Great Lakes. And as you can see here, um, these are all the different Great Lakes, and water levels go up and down over time. Um, the red line here is when the most recent um, high water period and then drop in, in water levels, and that happened in about 1999. So it's been a while since we've had high water levels, but you know, as I said, everything in turn comes back. So within the Great Lakes, Things that impact water levels on Lake Erie include everything that happens within the Great Lakes Basin. So this black outline here is the Great Lakes Basin. So everything that happens in here is going to impact the water levels on each of the Great Lakes. Those things include long-term climate changes, including the amount of precipitation that occurs, the amount of eva evaporation that occurs across the Great Lakes region, and the amount of runoff, so water from the land that enters into the Great Lakes. That's the net basin supply. So that's the total amount of water that we're going to have in the Great Lakes. So if it's raining a lot over Lake Superior, eventually that water is going to make its way down into Lake Erie. Additional things include seasonal changes in climate. So if we have a really rainy spring, we're going to see an increase in water levels on Lake Erie diversions into and out of the basin, and I'll show a map of that in a second, and then inflows and outflows, so water that comes within the Great Lakes Basin but kind of flows in between the different Great Lakes. That's going to change the water levels of each of the individual Great Lakes. Water level regulation, um, the Lake Superior and Lake Ontario are the only of the two Great Lakes that are actually regulated by man-made structures. Lake Erie is not regulated. And then, of course, wind and storm events. Everybody knows how bad erosion can be after we have a big nor'easter. You see a surge in water levels and then lots of wind um, and wave-based erosion. So this, again, is the Great Lakes Basin. You can see where the regulation structures are here on the St. Mary's River. As the water exit Lake Superior, it it is regulated the amount of water that can leave Lake Superior. And then here at the, the headwaters of the St. Lawrence River is the other water control structure that regulates the amount of water that's leaving um, Lake Ontario. Now water levels on Lake Superior and on Lake Ontario are regulated in accordance with plans that are approved by both Canada and the United States. So these are plans that um, there was a lot of discussion over and a lot of um, ultimate agreement over that the, the range of levels at those Great Lakes can be regulated. Um, keeping in mind that Lake Superior is a very, very big lake. It's very deep. There's a lot of water. So a small water change in Lake Superior can have an impact on Lake Erie. But overall, the way that the Great Lakes are regulated, those changes really have only a very minor, even negligible impact on the water levels within Lake Erie. There's also inflows in, so here in Lake Superior, there's an inflow that allows water to enter into Lake Superior. There's a diversion of 3,200 cubic feet per second that diverts out of uh, Lake Michigan. And then there's, you know, the flows in between the Great Lakes. So back to Lake Erie. So this is from, in this case, 1860 all the way up to 2019. You can see water levels have varied pretty significantly. The long-term average is about 571.3, so that's the blue line here is the long-term average lake level for Lake Erie. Low water datum, also known as chart datum for those of you boaters, is all the way down here at 569.2. You see Lake Erie water levels were really only that low 
during uh, the 1930s, so pretty much Dust Bowl era. Think of that's when you know, the Great Lakes were really low. Um, and then we see these, these spikes in water levels in 73, 86, and then in like 96. And then again in 2018 and 2019, we're seeing these high water levels again. Um, as of Friday, the water level on Lake Erie was 574.5, I believe, which is um, significantly higher than the long-term average of 571.4, and then um, much, much higher than you know the, the, the low, the low water datum for Lake Erie. So again, the, the takeaway from this is that water levels do change over time. They are very high right now but we are anticipating that they will decrease over time. This is another chart that shows just the last year of water level changes on Lake Erie. The green is the long-term average, so seasonal changes that I talked about earlier, you typically see low water levels in the winter, so January it's low, then you get your spring rains, the water levels increase, and then in October, November, December, they again start to decrease. So what we saw with the red is 2018. We saw water levels increasing and the water levels decreasing. 2019, water levels in January were a foot higher than what they were last year this time. So what we didn't see happen, which we normally see, if you look at the end of last year, water levels were way up here at 573. And then they were still up here at 573 in January. They didn't drop. Usually water levels will kind of decrease over the winter. We really didn't get that decrease this year, so we started out high, and that just continued to increase when we had all the rains that we had in April. So as it says here, we had a 37% increase in precipitation over Lake Erie just in April of 2019. And then leading to the, the increased water levels that we have right now. So for those of you that prefer numbers over graphs, I included this chart from the Army Corps of Engineers. And this shows our water level, and this is again, was it, well, this one was as of May 31st, water level was 574.5, which is 32 inches above the long-term average for May. So out of all the Mays that we have water level for, we are two and a half feet above the long-term average just for May. Um, and then um, we are six inches above the highest monthly average for May. So water levels this May are six inches higher than what, they on, on what the highest average water level was for May. So this also shows uh, the projected water level for Lake Erie, and this is projected by the Army Corps of Engineers. So they're saying that by July 1st, water levels will decrease by two inches. So that's a projection. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that's set in stone, that's what's gonna happen. In general, what we see is water levels typically peak sometime in June, so it is likely that water levels will start to peak and then decrease a little bit by, by July. Hopefully it's, it's by two inches or more, but it, it could, could still be the same, but we're hoping for a decrease. So that's my general spiel on water levels. Uh, next I'm gonna give you a brief tour of the coast of Lake Erie based on shoreline types. So this will be quick. Um, shoreline types, beautiful beach, right? Everybody loves Lake Erie beaches. So this is western Ottawa County. You can see by the yellow arrow that's kind of along the shore of Lake Erie where that photo is generally taken from. You have low-lying sandy beach areas, some marshy areas. In general, are they experiencing erosion? Yeah, they're experiencing erosion, but more so they're experiencing flooding right now. So their issues are very different from the issues that we're seeing here in the eastern part of the state. As we move west, on the west side of Cleveland, we get these vertical shale bluffs, typically not a lot of beach. The erosion that we see in these areas is more of a little bit of undercutting of the toe and then a huge block of the, of the shale will just fall at once. So someone will lose 10 or 15 feet of their backyard, perhaps overnight. Um, 
So eastern Lake County, we um, in most cases have a little bit lower uh, lying topography. The bluffs aren't quite as high. We have seawalls such as these vertical st structures here that provide shore protection. We have groins such as these that stick out perpendicular to shore that the intent of those groins is really to trap a beach and have that beach provide shore protection for your property as well as probably some recreational fun as well. Um, unfortunately, under wa higher water levels and just general lake conditions that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, the, the sandy beaches that used to be in eastern Lake County in most cases aren't, aren't there any longer or they're much diminished from what they used to be historically. So Ashtabula County, so this again is part of Lake County and then into Ashtabula County we see these high bluffs similar to the high bluffs that we see in Cuyahoga County. However, these are very different in that, in that they are glacial till. Glacial till is very easily erodible. It gets saturated at the upper portion of the bluff from groundwater, surface water. You get slumping at the top of the bluff. You get wave attack at the bottom of the, of the bluff. And next thing you know, your bluff is in the lake. So these bluffs are very difficult to protect because you have to protect the whole height of the bluff, either through regrading at the top and to, to create a shallower slope and then toe protection at the bottom. Additionally, these, these gray glacial tills are very slippery. You can get water seeps in them, and I'll show a diagram of that later. That can also lead to erosion and instability of the bluff itself. So in general, causes of erosion, we see wind erosion. So wind, uh, this is typically not what we see on Lake Erie, but it does happen sometimes if you've got to sand your bluff, you can have winds erode the upper portion or any portion of the bluff face that's made of a unconsolidated sand or a loose sand. Uh, mostly what we see is bluff slumping. So you get groundwater that saturated the top of the bluff. It's, it's making those soils weak. And then that whole section of bluff is just going to lose its stability and it just slumps slumps down into the lake. Um, we get sliding, which is similar to slumping, except you get groundwater lower in the bluff and you just get little sections of the bluff sliding into the lake, whereas the upper portion of the bluff still may remain stable for a short period of time. We get toe erosion, again, wave attack. You have waves attacking the toe of the bluff, eroding it, undercutting it. If you undercut the toe of your bluff, then the upper portion of the bluff has nothing to hold it in place and then ultimately you will get this bluff slumping here as well. Um, if you've got surface water drainage, you can have surface water forming uh, rills and gullies. I don't know what I'm doing here. There we go. Rills and, you know, my pointer's not doesn't like me. Okay, you can get rills and gullies where you basically get erosion. You get a little stream of water going down the front of your bluff. Um, a lot of times people will try to take care of drainage on their upland by putting, by routing it into pipes and then pushing those pipes over their bluff and letting the water drain out over the pipes. That's really good because it keeps the erosion from saturating the upland. However, it's very important that those pipes either extend so far over the bluff that when the water comes down out of the pipes, it doesn't hit your bluff face because if it does, that's going to cause erosion. Um, what we typically recommend is that you put some sort of a flexible pipe on that and route it all the way down the bluff and into the lake so it's not going to actively erode the upland. Um, you don't want to prevent erosion in one area by causing it somewhere else. So here is a diagram, again, showing how a bluff can change with increased water levels. So here, am I not doing something right? I don't know. Okay, so the top left-hand photo, you have a relatively stable bluff, um, and then water levels start to increase, and then on the photo all the way to the right, you see the toe of the bluff is starting to undercut, and then the photo on the bottom, the slumping starts to occur because there's nothing holding that, that bluff in place because the toe has been undercut. And then eventually over time, water levels go back down, everything stabilizes and everybody's happy until 10 or 15 years later when water levels raise up again, more wave action comes, the toe gets undercut again, the slumping occurs, and it's just a cyclical cycle. The bluff wants to be happy, it wants to be at a stable slope, and as soon as the toe gets cut back, 
then the upper portion of the bluff is going to have to react in a way so that way it can be at its happy, stable slope. So some photos that we took uh, semi-recently. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is bluff erosion that uh, we took photos of on April 24, 2019 in Mentor. You can see the concrete structure in front of, oh, there it is. The concrete structure here, and there's some here, and then there's some here. That was probably either a seawall or a break wall that I'm gonna guess somebody probably installed in the 50s, 60s, maybe 70s. Probably did a pretty good job protecting that property for a long period of time. Um, but structures are only meant to last for so long. They require, you know, some maintenance. And when you get undercutting, it looks like this, the structure here actually was undercut in front. So wave action hit the front of the structure, scoured out the toe of the, um, the lake bed in front of the structure, and then eventually the structure just flipped over. So a flipped over structure isn't gonna provide the amount of protection that a straight, a vertical structure is going to. So once the structure flipped over, you had waves overtopping the structure and then erosion of the land immediately behind the structure. So that's what we're seeing here. This is a native or unprotected bluff at this location. This is in Willoughby. This is a park, actually. You can see there's netting put up trying to let people know, hey, this is a dangerous area. You probably shouldn't go there. Um, again, we've got upper bluff instability and slumping. This whole area here used to be up here. Over here, we have Great Lakes erosion control modules. These were put in a lot in the 80s. Um, how many people have those types of modules in front of their property? A few people. Are they working well? No. They don't work well under high water levels. Under lower water levels, they are meant to kind of trap a beach and help protect your property, but under higher water levels, they get overtopped. They also experience the same type of uh, damage where they can get undercut and then tilt over, and then you've got water hitting them and splashing up, and then ice freezing on your upland and causing freeze-thaw th damage on your upland as well. Um, so under certain water levels, they work great. Under other water levels, they don't work as well. And that's the problem with erosion control measures. You can't have one structure that's going to be perfect under every water level condition. You have to pick a design that's going to work well or sort of well under most, most water level conditions. Um, and then this is really scary. I don't know if you can see this, but this right here is someone's like back patio. It's like a little concrete pad. This is their house is right there. This is a slump. So this is probably about 10 feet where as we talked earlier, instability of the toe or saturation of the upland, and that whole section just slumped down. Um, a lot of times we see this when it had happened previously, and then a homeowner will, in order to help protect their property, they'll add fill material. So they'll dump fill to fill in this area and grade it out. Um, that works for a while, maybe 10, maybe 15 years, but eventually the same thing is going to happen again. And then that will continue to happen until all that material that you've placed there has eventually ended up on the shore and now you've got concrete rubble or whatever it was that you used to fill this area is now covering the beach in front of your property. Um, and I think we've seen that a lot in front of the, the project that the city of Euclid is doing. There's just a lot of concrete rubble that people had placed with good intentions of stabilizing their property, but in the long run it's, it's not a good solution. So what are good solutions? Beaches. Beaches are great solutions, except for when you have really high water levels and then the beaches get submerged. They still do provide a little bit of protection because the, the sand is still there. It's just farther offshore. So it's still breaking the waves. It's just not providing protection to the toe of your bluff from immediate wave action. Um, revetments. These are very common structures along the shore of Lake Erie. They are typically large stone um, so large stone by like, you know, stone like this big, like three tons, so six to 10,000 pounds per stone. It's typically um, armor stone. Sorry, I'm just checking my time to see how long I've been talking to you so I don't bore everyone to tears. Okay, so armor stone revetments, very stable structures. They require very little maintenance. It's basically large rocks placed at a slope with an appropriate bedding material so the material behind them doesn't wash out. They protect the toe, they protect the upper portion or the middle portion of the bluff, and then usually above 
the armor stone revetments, you will regrade your bluff to a shallower slope. A lot of people will put ornamental vegetation or vegetation that's going to pull more native vegetation that's going to actually pull water out of the upper bluff to prevent additional slumping from oversaturation. Seawalls, this is an example on the upper photo of a concrete block seawall. We see a lot of these on Lake Erie. The benefit of seawalls, and down here I think this is like a concrete panel seawall. The benefit of seawalls is they are good at providing shore protection and they're also generally good for providing lake access. So if you, a lot of times these will be capped with concrete, people can put like a chair out there or it'll be an easy access to a dock that they've installed. So revetments are purely typically just for shore protection and seawalls also can provide shore protection as well as lake access. So those are the two or the three main types of erosion protections that are solely for erosion protection that we see on Lake Erie in general. So, if you wanted to do erosion protection along your property, what do you need to do as far as permitting goes? From DNR, uh, you are required to obtain a construction permit anytime you're constructing a measure that will control erosion, wave action, or flooding. So we don't see a lot of flooding permits. Usually it's, it's erosion control measures that we see applications for. So right now we have two options for, for shore structure permits. You can go through the standard shore structure permitting process which um, I'm going to go through the differences in a second, or you can go through the temporary shore erosion permit process. The, the, shore structure, the full shore structure permit is a permanent permit. It's valid for the life of your structure. You can rehabilitate the structure um, as long as the structure is still there. A temporary shore structure permit is valid for two years, and it's really meant for emergency situations for you to be able to come in, get, get what you need to get done to protect your property, and then come back in later for a longer term solution. So since, looks at my numbers here. So we implemented the temporary shore structure permitting pro process in May of last year because that was when we really started seeing high water levels. Individuals were having a hard time not only getting contractors to come to their properties, but they were having a hard time getting the consultant that was required for the full shore structure permit. So in an attempt to help people get their erosion control measures done quicker, we implemented this in May of 2018. So in 2018, we issued 58 temporary shore structure permits. And in, uh, so far in 2019, we've issued 31. Now that may not seem a lot to you, but on average, the full shore structure permit, DNR only issues 20 a year for the whole, the whole lake. And that's not just for erosion control projects, that's for docks, marinas, um, um, everything. So we've seen quite an uptick in the number of permits that we've been issuing. Um, so the full shore structure permit is meant for, again, anything that's going to control erosion, wave action, or flooding. So typically revetment seawalls, groins, detached breakwaters, docks. A temporary shore structure permit can only be used if you have an emergency, which right now I think a lot of people are having emergencies. So I don't think we've ever said, no, you can't have a temporary because it's not an emergency. So it has to be an emergency and it has to be solely for erosion control. So if you want to build a dock, you can't do it under a temporary permit. If you want to repair an existing structure, meaning an erosion control structure, or if you want to build a new erosion control measure, you can do that under a temporary permit. The full shore structure permit allows construction over a two year period. It is renewable and then that permit is valid for the life of the structure. So as long as the structure is there, you have the ability to maintain the structure in accordance with the permit design. The temporary authorization is valid for two years. So at the end of the two year period, you need to come back to ODNR, go through the full shore structure permitting process to make sure that the structure that you put in is really capable of withstanding long term um, lake forces, wave action, ice forces, um, specific to your site. Um, and, and, sure. So I have my temporary short structure permit and I have my most done. So now I'm trying to get the short structure permanent permit, but I cannot get one engineer to come to my house. So we understand that that's an issue and um, the engineers are extremely busy right now. There's not very many of them. No, there are not. So we are doing our best to encourage new engineering firms to 
start doing coastal engineering work on Lake Erie. But the list that you guys send, I called almost every single number and there was not one person. And everyone on that list is someone who has submitted applications to our office in the past. So, I mean, um, is there going to be some plan to allow the temporary permit to become a permanent permit? And, and that is something that we have to work through within DNR. I think um, the intent of the permit is that within two years you would come back and apply for a full shore structure permit. When the temporary permit was initiated, we really didn't know how long water levels were going to be this high. So if water levels would have suddenly dropped this year, then I don't think the consultants would be as busy as they are right now. And one of the reasons we went to the temporary permit process was because we knew how difficult it was to get the consultants to do the engineering design work because they themselves were Who so did backlogged. the engineering for the Euclid City's uh, <coughs> work? So that would so that are was, you available to come to the So uh, you can feel free to talk with him afterwards, but I have a time frame I'm really trying to stay hard to stick with, and I'd be more than happy to answer other questions after. Um, so I, I, what she's alluding to is that part of the full shore structure permit, you are required per Ohio Revised Code to have a registered professional engineer do the design of your structure. So if you get a temporary permit, you're not required to have that engineer do the design for the temporary permit because the permit is meant to be for a temporary structure, something that's not going to be in the lake for a long period of time, or something that you are going to come in and either modify or go through the full permitting process as is and get approval at that point in time. So you are required to have an engineer certify that your structure is um, adequately designed and constructed to withstand ice forces and wave action on Lake Erie over the long term. The intent of that is to make sure that we're not allowing people to build structures that are going to damage adjacent properties. If, if your structure isn't adequately designed and constructed, constructed, it's ultimately going to fail and that could damage, it could become a hazard for recreational users of Lake Erie, it could cause increased erosion on adjacent properties. So that's the intention of the um, engineering design requirement. Um, <coughs> so. For the full shore structure permit, we review for structural stability, long-term functionality, impacts to sand resources, and we also want to make sure that if you're applying for the permit that you are in fact the upland owner and you do have the right to build that structure there. For the temporary permit, really what we're looking at is if the structure is going to function, it's going to provide the erosion protection you're looking for. It's made of materials that are suitable to be used on Lake Erie, so broken concrete rubble is not something that we will approve um, as part of a temporary shore structure permit unless that material is covered with a large armor stone that's not going to allow it to escape and um, enter the lake. And then again, to make sure that you are the upland property owner, we don't want to issue a permit to somebody who, you know, to build a structure that extends onto their neighbor's property if their neighbor isn't okay with that. Um, shore structure permits, the full ones, it takes three to six months to get those permits issued. And temporaries, we're typically issuing within a week and in a lot of cases less than a week. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, per temporary permit process is very simple. It's a one page form that you as a homeowner can fill out yourself. Basically, just including your mailing information, the site address, like a one sentence description of what you're doing. I'm going to put rock along the side, along the frontage of my property, and it's going to be 6,000 pounds each stowed, and it's going to be 100 feet long. That's the type of description we're looking for. And then you need to provide um, a few <clears throat> additional uh, items, including a title deed and then a map showing your general location. So you can print this off of Google Earth and take a marker and put a star and say, This is my site. Take a photo of it with your phone, scan it with your scanner, you know, anyway, and then email that to us. Um, an overhead view. So in this case, we're showing that there's going to be uh, some sort of a structure. It looks like three to five ton armor stone placed along this stretch of shore where this green line is. Again, you go on Google Earth or some other overhead aerial view or map of your property. You draw a line with a pen, marker, crayon, it doesn't matter what it is showing the length of property your structure is going to occupy. And then these little arrows just kind of show this is the width of the structure. I'm only going to put stone right in this area here. We need a side sketch, which is a little bit more challenging. But this is like if you have a layer cake, like a birthday cake, and you cut it in half, this is what your structure is going to look like. 
So just pointing out important features, the top of your bluff is about 25 feet above the lake level. I'm going to put this big stone all along here. I have these existing concrete block. I'm going to just leave those block there but put stone over top of them. I mean, that's really what we're, what we're looking for. So that's the basic components of a temporary shore structure permit application. You can mail it to us, you can email it to us. Most of the ones that we get in are emailed to us. That's super easy for us to just, we don't even have to print anything off ever. We just look at it and it goes really quick. We respond to you via email. We can email your permit to you. If you prefer regular mail, we can do everything via regular mail as well. So available assistance from DNR. We do have free on-site technical assistance. We have two other engineers at the office that uh, right now are going out doing site visits probably four days a week. Um, they try to group site visits together, so as we get calls in, we assign them to whatever engineer may be going out to, say, mentor or wherever sometime that week, so that way we can try to get as many site visits in at one time. We are located in, in Sandusky, so it is a, an hour or two drive, depending on where we're going across the state. But we'll have an engineer from our office come out to your site. We can do a quick review to see if we have any previous history with your site. Has someone called us out there before? Do we have any historic photos? Do we have any old permits so we know what kind of to expect when we get there? Um, we'll provide recommendations for what we think would work best at your site. We can give you ideas on what you have that is working, what you have that isn't working. Um, yeah, and if you're not available to be on site to meet us with your permission, we can go to your site and then get back to you via a phone call or email. We can only do that if we have your permission. We do not access private property without the permission of the property owner. So that's our technical assistance program. Um, we do have a coastal erosion area loan program. These are not handled by DNR. They are actually through the Ohio Water Development Authority and they are administered by, by local counties. I'm not sure if your county participates. If you go on our website, um, I can look that up. I meant to look that up before I, before I, I came here. I apologize. I, I know Lake County does not participate. I'm not sure if Cuyahoga does or not, though. <laughs> but I think about half of the counties do. But they're meant to be low interest loans, and they will cover the engineering design and construction of the uh, property of the project. The problem with these loans is because interest rates recently, or over the last 10 years or so, have not been high, they've been rather low, that these loans really weren't competitive. So in the 17 years I've worked for DNR, I think I've seen four of these loans. So your property has to be in a coastal erosion area in order to be eligible for a loan, and your county has to be participating. I put coastal management assistance grants on here. These are not available for private property. They are only available for um, Local governments, county, regional planning agencies, universities, school districts, conservancy districts, port authorities, and certain nonprofit groups. And this is only for design of um, like access structures and restoration projects, not necessarily for, and definitely not for construction of erosion control measures. But I want to throw that out there just in case anyone here is a part of any of those other organizations so they're aware for those organizations that we do have these planning grants available. So you can contact our office, and we have a database of um, anything that we have permitted since 1955, and we can, um, we can look that up. I do want to add that if you call our office and you have us come out and do technical assistance, or if you call our office and want to know if your project was permitted, if I find out that you have a structure that was never permitted, I'm not going to make you do anything with that structure. All I'm going to tell you is if you want to modify it or upgrade it or do anything to it, then you need to get a permit. If you're going to do new work, you need a permit. But if you have an existing structure you're not doing anything with, no one's complaining about, I'm not going to say, oh, that's not permitted, you have to do whatever. That, that's not how DNR works. We only do compliance currently when things are causing problems or when people are doing new work. A lot of times people buy properties that they didn't build the structure to begin with, someone else built it, and they didn't even know it wasn't permitted when they built the property. So if you're doing new work, then we're going to ask you to get a permit. But yeah, you can call our office and we can check our database.
much. I, and I'm, I'll be around after, and I don't want to take up everybody's time now, so, but I will be around and able to answer individual questions. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. And I, I, we have two other presenters, and then I think everyone's going to stay so we can answer questions. But I do want to make sure, because I do think some of your questions hopefully will be answered by either Smith Group or Haynes. And so, uh, Bill, if you would like to come on up. Bill is from Smith Group. They are our engineers and consultants for our lakefront project. Um, but they are national experts, actually international, do work um, across the Great Lakes. One of the things we liked about them when we interviewed, we're looking for consultants for our lakefront project years ago. They, you know, we met with several, they presented their plans, and we said, well, how many of these plans have actually been built? And they looked at us kind of funny and said, well, well all of them. So they, because the work that they do, they know they work with the regulatory agencies so they know what is permitted. They work with the funders and they've been great partners to us. Uh, we would not be in, in construction without the help of Smith Group. So Bill, thank you for being here. He's going to share with you, I think, some of the products and projects that are um, providing erosion control as examples, right? Yep, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Bill Rosnick. I'm a civil engineer at Smith Group. Um, we are working currently on the Euclid Waterfront Improvement Project. And uh, it's been a process that's been going on for about a decade. We started um, with the vision in the city and creating our goals about 10 years ago. And we've worked with the city trying to get some of these public-private partnerships, the permits. Um, I think the mayor's done a good job introducing it, and Debbie's talked about the permit. So I'm going to focus more on the design development that we did, the, uh, some of the modeling and testing that we did for the coastal structures, and the uh, construction of it. So the reason I assume many of you are, are here today is the uh, uh, coast of Lake Erie is comprised in, locally of these pretty tall glacier till bluffs. Um, I think on site they're about 40 feet high, and they're susceptible to erosion. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about the erosion. I think Debbie touched on that pretty well beforehand, but um, I kind of break these into two, two sets of factors. We've got erosion that can happen from above water. Um, for the most part, that stormwater runoff or seepage through that kind of carries sediment down. Um, and then the other, the other set of factors are coastal, coastal processes, um, being water levels, waves, and currents. And, and when the water levels are high, we see a lot of wave attack at the tow. And it's a, it's a cyclical process that, that creates a slope that, that is unstable. So for the Euclid project, we took a lot of geotechnical borings to know what kind of soil we had there. And, uh, what we did is we uh, ran these slope stability analyses and we were able to, to determine kind of what slopes would actually be stable when vegetated, you know, how we can actually design our site and leave it so that it would last. And just a little bit of background. Um, I know we talked about this already, but um, this has gotten a lot of press lately. Right now, Lake Erie water levels are at record highs. And water levels become very important when you're designing coastal structures because you want them to be resilient at high water levels as well as low water levels. And right now, what we're seeing is with these high water levels, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot more wave action and wave attack at the toe of the bluff. And so when the water levels are high, more of the beach is inundated and more waves can, can attack. There's more wave energy attacking these bluffs. Um, so what we did is we created several of these computer models. Um, on the left, you'll see um, an image where the hotter colors are, are higher wave heights and the cooler colors are a little bit lower. So we ran many simulations to, to characterize the coastal climate. Um, on the right, what you'll see is currents. We, all, we did the same computer numerical modeling for the currents. Um, what we found out in Euclid is predominantly the waves are from west to east. And specifically on our site, the waves are higher. You get higher wave heights and more wave energy on the east part of our site. So that, that really kind of guides how we design our site 
what coastal structures go where and how we kind of fit all these coastal structures in and still maintain the vision and the goals that we started with with the city. Um, knowing these two um, coastal, coastal processes and characterizing all that information, um, the third thing that uh, becomes very important is the sediment transport. Um, we basically look at the image on the right is the uh, critical erosion areas, um, and that's from uh, ODNR from 2010. And on site, we have several areas where the bluff was quickly eroding. So we can estimate how much of that sediment from the bluff is eroding and how much of it is staying on site. Some of that actually, actually adds to the beach and, and offers a little bit of protection. But in general, a lot of the, the, the fine grain soil gets washed away to the middle of the lake and actually doesn't stay on shore. Um, the left image is the, uh, shows the sediment transport pattern. So generally, because the waves are from west to east, so is the sediment transport. And, and, and when we're designing our site, we need to know where it's coming from, where it's going, and we need to design our site such that None of our coastal structures are, are trapping any more sediment that we want because um, we, we don't want to affect any adjacent areas. We basically need to know where it's coming from, where it's going, and we try not to alter that. So once we had our conceptual design, what we did is actually create a physical model of this. Um, the two images you see are from a wave tank up in Canada. It's a 50 meter by 30 meter wave tank. And there's two wave generators that are actually creating waves to scale. And they're actually impacting our structures and our beaches, just so we can make sure that, that our design is, is optimized. We're not creating any negative effects that we haven't considered. And um, we basically did this because the Euclid Waterfront Improvements Project, you know, it's, it's significant. There's a high cost, there's a high importance to the community. We want to make sure nothing was left uh, unconsidered. So for these, for, these, for, these, for these wave tanks, we actually ran about 90 scenarios. And there is sand in place so that um, we, can, we can determine exactly how those beach profiles are going to change and how that sand is going to transport around our coastal structures. The other important thing we learned from this wave tank is that um, every little stone is a, is, a, is a miniature replica of what's out there. So we, we uh, became confident that our coastal structures that we're actually building, which I'll get to in a second, the breakwaters and the revetments, are actually themselves stable and they'll last and they won't get eroded with the high waves and the high water. So we used what we've got from our computer modeling results as well as our physical modeling results and we kind of optimized the shape and location of all of our structures. We ended up tweaking the shapes of a lot of our offshore breakwaters. We actually removed a couple offshore breakwaters that were in a little bit too, too deep of water and we learned that there were a couple areas where we were building beaches behind some of these coastal structures. And in some of those areas, we didn't want those coastal structures to, to negatively impact the natural sediment transport. So we, we tweaked them such that no sand that's out there would get trapped and we weren't creating any other erosion adjacent to the property. And we actually improved from west to east a lot of the natural sediment that's out there will keep moving and that sand can continue to protect adjacent properties from, from additional erosion. So after all of our modeling and our conceptual layout, we got to actually designing the shore protective structures that are in place. Um, and here I, I put a couple cross sections of examples of those, um, whether you do a full permit or an emergency permit, you will need some sort of cross-section. So I guess first off, 
On the upper left is uh, a cross-section of a breakwater. We, we, we incorporated a combination of these to make the site interesting, to create habitat, and to, and to protect the shore. So offshore, we have some breakwaters, some tombolos. Um, to the bottom left, uh, the bottom left we show a cobble beach. We're actually placing cobble that will um, that'll create that beach. And on the right side of that same image um, is a stone revetment. Most of our shore in some form has a stone revetment. There's a couple different designs depending on the wave action, but that sloped stone basically minimizes the wave energy that will impact the toe of the bluff, which kind of begins the cycle of creating that unstable slope. Um, to the, in the upper right, Every, every slope that we're leaving on that bluff is going to get cut back such that it's stable. And that'll get vegetated mostly with prairie grasses because those roots kind of lock in the soil and, and take out a lot of moisture from it. Um, in some areas where we were a little bit constrained with how much room we had to actually design, we're, we're incorporating some retaining walls into it too. So there's a lot of different solutions in this one project. And this is a photo of the construction progress. Again, the slopes aren't graded, it's not finished. Not all of the retaining walls are in, but you can see an example of the stone revetment. You can see some of the offshore breakwaters and tombolos, we call them, which are protecting the beach. You can see the beginning of the cobble beach. It isn't filled to grade with the cobble that will remain, but um, we're getting there. And lastly, we wanted to incorporate uh, ecology into our, into our engineering solution. So once the stone is placed and the retaining walls are in and the slope is graded back, it's actually going to be planted. There's a lot of carefully selected prairie vegetation which are going to get planted on the upland. Not only will that help stabilize the slope of the bluff, but it'll actually create habitat for, for upland birds and, and, a, and a lot of other animals. Um, closer to the water, there'll be some aquatic vegetation or wetland species. And we've actually got, we have one bioretention. It's basically a rain garden, and that's, that serves the purpose to treat stormwater before it's discharged into the lake. And aside from the planting, even the stone and the cobble will actually create habitat for fish, turtles, all sorts of species. The fish, the uh, fish like to spawn on the stone. So on the left, we've got, we've got cobble that's selected that the fish prefer to spawn in. Um, on the right, I'd also like to point out, we see a lot of driftwood washing up. We get a lot of, we get a lot of trees and driftwood and that's actually mimicking kind of a natural shoreline. So birds like to perch on these, on these big driftwoods that blow in. So that's actually incorporated into the design. We don't want to get rid of all of it because aside from creating access and protecting the shoreline, we're, we're mimicking the, the natural habitat of the shoreline. So this might be a busy slide. Some of these might be a little bit too small to see, but there's, there's a lot of waterfowl. There's ducks, there's geese, there's seagulls. We're seeing herons already. We're not even done. And, and they, like, they're, they like to perch on the stone that we're placing. Um, upland, you know, the planting isn't in yet, but the plan was to create a habitat that would be preferable to a lot of upland birds when we're all done. And, so far, I think it's working. This is just a photo I, I, I snapped the other day. We have a couple herons that really like the site. And I'll end with, uh, the bottom is a rendering of the completed project and the, the top is, is a progress shot that uh, we took from the drone. So we are, we're getting there. It's starting to look like, like it is proposed. With that, I can take some questions now. I can take questions at the end. I will be around. My contact information is up there. If you do want to get a hold of my, my team, we'd be happy to talk to you.
Pardon me? The finish date. We've gotten a lot of rain this spring, so that has been a topic of discussion. I believe... End of October? I, originally, it was this fall, this phase of it. Any, so most of the people here represent either individual properties or are part of a beach club. Any, what connection would you have from this project, which is much larger, most of them won't undertake the same type level of engineering and the scale of this project, what would your be advice be to individual property owners? Correct. We, you know, we created this with a lot of a lot of goals in mind, and obviously, no one's going to have the same set of goals. So we we can definitely create engineering drawings to whatever whatever your goal and vision would be. Um, do you, does your firm do work with individual homes? We have. I, I'd think I would say for the most part. You know, we've got a pretty big team to keep busy. I think most of the projects we go after are, are a pretty large scale, but we have done individual homes. And especially, like you mentioned, a homeowners association, something with, you know, a, a lot of homeowners with, trying to protect the same, the same stretch of coast, something like that would be, it'd be a possibility, absolutely. Right. Okay. Well, let me, while we're um, waiting, let me invite Mark Haynes and Craig Smith to come up and join us. They are our contractors who are building this wonderful project um, to share and also do work across Northeast Ohio and beyond, right? Construction, do a lot of waterfront projects. I'll let them introduce their expertise, and then we will have time for questions uh, from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, as they spoke, we are the contractor here for the city of Euclid. Um, Mark started the business 37 years ago. Uh, we do a lot of wetland work, shoreline revetment work. <coughs> um, from residential to public, you know, so the size of the job necessarily does not matter. Uh, before we get started, the mayor did make a huge point in the beginning that if residents can get together, um, it's going to help with access. It's going to help with funding. Um, you know, there's, you know, the volume of the stone, the volume of the work will help lower the price. Plus, three neighbors together may not have an entrance in. The fourth one might. So just things to think about as we go through. Um, what we did is we just put down some of our local resident drawings that have been given to us for the temporary permits that were applied for. Um, there's some before, and then, and it's probably hard to see at this distance. Um, I do have a few of the handouts we can give out, but it shows basic the same concepts everybody's talked about. It's got the toe stone, the armor eventment, the cobble core, um, up above to a certain elevation, which, you know, that is where an engineer comes into play. We know what has been done in certain areas across Lake Erie in the past. Um, one project we just recently completed a, a huge portion on up at Cedar Point on the Chausse. You know, I don't know if anybody had heard about it. Uh, the, the waves were basically taking the road away for the entrance into Cedar Point. They put about 40,000 tons of armor to build the revetment. And that was the typical cross section used there, which is really no different whether it sits there with the road behind or ties directly into a bluff. And again, it's, it's heavier stone on the face smaller stone behind for the core. The, the hatched areas were existing concrete. As a lot of you probably do have down at the bottom, there is concrete that somebody's dumped over in the past that can be utilized into a revetment. And that's just some of the details and an overall view. Uh, private resident up in Mentor on the Lake. Again, a tall bluff, um, sloughing and losing amounts of property, and the same type concept. These are obviously a lot more simple than looking at the Euclid project, um, but they're also, you know, more in the temporary idea to get you guys protected and you stop losing valuable property. Each site's different. Yeah. Uh, 
we, we could probably see sight uh, as we see it. We work with a, uh, we enjoy working with Smith and JJR and, and others on these bigger projects. We also have a handful of uh, other engineers we work with on the smaller projects. Uh, but uh, there is really, uh, no two sites are the same to price. I can't, we can't stand here in front of 100 people and, and throw out a price, but we can get with, with people that Individually. are interested. Yes. And there again, like I spoke in the beginning, access um, has a lot to do with the price. We've been doing enough of these now that we're one of only a handful of contractors that's invited into the quarries at Sandusky. That's where all this armor rock comes from. So we are a supplier also. So uh, 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 availability has been tough. The quarries are having a hard time keeping up right. with armor stone. And uh, one, that's been an issue. One benefit, uh, we're currently in Parkertown Quarry, which is a Hanson quarry. We take the raw material they provide, we size, sort it, we load it, we haul it ourselves. Um, so there's an advantage to us controlling that for the projects. All the armor stone in the quarry comes off a ledge that was Army Corps approved and is the same stone used on public projects. Yes. Um, this is kind of similar to one of the questions from the back and I wasn't sure who that came from. They've got a current concrete wall that has failed with the raising water levels. Obviously after your temporary shore permits in place, a tow was proposed to go down in front of that wall to stabilize the tow. The wall did not have to be removed. It could be left in place and then the slope build up. I mean, these are really our key factors from our experience in our construction. You know, the size of the rock, especially on the face, um, the slope, and Mark would be a prime one to tell you, we have done concrete walls. We definitely stick more with the armor rock. It dissipates the energy as to where a wall will take the full blunt of the energy. So the rock does break it up and usually seems to last a little longer. Um, fabric underneath the backside between the earth bluff and the concrete rubble core is key to make sure that, because the water is gonna infiltrate in and out and it doesn't pull any more of the earth from the tow. Installing a tow key, um, we do know at times people just want dump rock and you can see, and, and we've seen it here on some recent projects we've looked at for people, they get in a panic, they dump rock over the hill. If it's not keyed in, there's nothing protecting that from basically washing out into the lake and then again, attacking the bluff and how the rock is placed. I mean, our, our company and our guys, I think Bill could probably attest, our guys have done enough of the rock work to try to key it in. So it locks in place rather than just lay it up there and still be susceptible to wave action. What comes first, the construction company or the engineer? When you guys seem to know. Temporary permit. Temporary permit. <laughs> If you already have a permit on an existing structure, then it would be free to give us a call. Yeah, you're allowed be, to maintain Because you're allowed to maintain. Do you have barges to bring in the house if there's no access to the We do not ourselves, but we do work with others. So there would be means and methods there to make work. Obviously, barge work usually tends to be more expensive just because of the reloading and loading costs. And on that note, we've got some pretty specialized machines. Uh, we, we're not using them all on this big project with Euclid, but we can get in between houses and, and uh, traverse some pretty steep slopes to make that happen. Uh, where people think they need a barge, but maybe they don't. How far out in time are you on the now? How far are you uh, <laughs> We've done a lot of them. We've done a lot of them this year, but... Uh, there's, there's still some openings. Yes. Well, and that's part of it too. We do a lot of public work, you know, and we do private work. So we actually do have one to two crews that just run private work. So there's opportunities. Can we be there tomorrow? Probably not. Is there something we could look at, you know, beginning of next week and be there within a couple of weeks? Definitely. What are your options when you have a pile-driven steel brake wall from the 80s? 
it's cracked and failing and that kind of thing. But that's what's protecting my land. It would be good to look at it again, because as Mark said, every scenario is different. Um, there has been some that basically out in front of that, you still could go and put in a tow key and bring the slope up over it. Um, a lot of that's preference. If a resident owner wants to still try to incorporate that wall into some type of landing, you can put a tow and a slope to it, depending on how high, what level of protection that's going to do to keep washing and undermining with wave action, or you can go right up and over top. Um, really comes into preference. I know there's a lot of different people here who have different needs. I, you know, one question that I think probably to start with is, who do I call first? I'm guessing it starts with the shore, the temporary permit, and or maybe the technical assistance from ODNR. Is that a good place to start? So, so we encourage people to get with your neighbors first and see what your neighbors, if your neighbors are interested in doing a project with you. Uh, then we encourage you to contact uh, us for our technical assistance. Um, oh, sure. So contacting DNR for technical assistance is always good. Uh, some people choose just to go directly to a contractor or directly to a consultant. Uh, with the temporary permits, you can kind of bypass the consultant, so go working with the contractor. I, I would recommend, not that these guys aren't great because they are, I would recommend that you contact multiple contractors. Some contractors specialize in certain types of projects, so just contacting one, you may not get the full um, suite of projects that may be available. If you contact us for technical assistance, we can provide that information to you. And then if you contacted them and they said, hey, this is what we do, and that was one of the things that we suggested, then you know that's probably a good option. I think, well, I may have a skewed perception because I am an engineer, but I, I, I think most people do contact us first in my experience, but we've done, we've done kind of design build partnerships and there's even scenarios where someone's hired a contractor and they need a little guidance and they contact us later on. So I think, I think it's kind of all over the board. Uh, and yes, I would agree that uh, the first call could certainly be uh, to ODNR, <laughs> and 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 what a great program that they made it within. We we've, we've done so many projects where they've had that temporary permit uh, just to buy them some time to have the engineer look at it and take it to the next level. And why what a program tonight? I want to thank Mrs. Mayor and ODNR and Bill because uh, I got. I mean, I've been doing this for years, and and I picked up some more information tonight also, and. Uh, uh, not to mislead anybody at Haynes Construction, our specialty is the rock revetment walls, like Debbie said. So uh, if you call us, we're probably not going to be promoting a steel wall or a concrete wall. But if, if you're in the need for a rock revetment, uh, we'd be interested. I think that we studied in particular the bluff and the beach and the lake out front. Now if you go adjacent properties that aren't immediately far away, your coastal climate being the waves and currents isn't going to change much because you're in the same place as the lake. But we don't know the geology of the shore necessarily. It could change. And so we generally look at each site um, as it comes up, kind of individually. Uh, yes, I'm going to have Director Holiday, Jonathan Holiday, come up. They just um, went to a meeting to learn about it. It's called the Special Improvement District. Uh, and I, I'm going to let Jonathan talk about that. Yes, thank you. As uh, mentioned earlier, last year Senate Bill 51 was passed. That went into effect this March. And what that does is it allows private property to be assessed a special assessment through the creation of a special improvement district to fund 
the shoreline stabilization, even if the shoreline stabilization is completely privately owned and for private use. So this was a change of state law. We're not aware of any property owners that have enacted this yet, but we are watching it very closely and we're happy to talk with any of you that may be interested in this. This is um, essentially where one or more property owners voluntarily uh, elect to have an assessment placed on their annual property taxes. And this creates a revenue stream that can be used to repay uh, basically the debt for the cost of the installation of the shoreline stabilization. Uh, what we do know about Senate Bill 51 is that it requires the city's involvement. Uh, basically, our council will have to pass legislation. Uh, so we are happy to talk with any of the property owners that may be interested in using this as a revenue stream or a way to generate a revenue stream to pay for the improvements. Uh, we're also um, working with uh, our Port Authority and uh, perhaps the county as potential entities that could take that revenue stream and capitalize it to help uh, create the funds up front to pay for the improvements. So we're happy to talk with you about that if you think that's something that you or your neighbors may be interested in taking advantage of as a way to pay for the uh, improvements. We will make all these slides available too for anyone who wants them. I think that's why anyone who signed in with their email, will we send them? We can send that to you. We'll also put the whole presentation on our city website, cityofeuclid.com, so you can get that as well. And this meeting will be rebroadcast and available on the library's website. So I don't know, I really wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, you know, what a great turnout. We're happy to stay engaged in this, help you where we can. We know, you know, the importance of the lake to our community as a whole, you as individual property owners or members of a beach club or neighborhood association. Um, this is a really important, uh, really important issue. And so we are here to help. Uh, Councilwoman McIntosh, I don't know if you wanna add a word or Council President Mancuso. Um, and please, are you guys able to stay around if people have individual questions? We will make the handouts available. Um, I hope this was helpful, informative, educational. Thank you very much for coming.